Hi, I'm Jay. And I'm R. And in this video, we're going to watch Answers in Genesis try to justify why there are lots of different races in the world who are supposedly descendants of Adam and Eve. So let's get to it. I hear this one a lot. How can there be so many races in the world if we are all descendants of Adam and Eve? That's actually a good question. Why is that? Well, check this out. First off, let's talk about the word race. Sometimes when people use the word, they mean supposed races of people who have evolved at different times, rates, and in different locations. That's not true. Of course, the word race is also a term we use to distinguish between groups with different physical traits, namely skin color. Okay, maybe we should clarify this. Race in regards to mankind is just a method to categorize genetic characteristics and phenotypes among humans as a species. And though we might think of skin color when talking about race, because it's so visually obvious, is actually one of the least significant factors when talking about genetic differences among humans. Also, that animation makes it seem like you think evolution suggests different races evolved separately in different parts of the world from the same ancestor species. This would be an example of parallel evolution, which is rare but possible. However, the scientific consensus for race variation is genetic drift and natural selection over the past 50,000 years, which began when the human race migrated away from Africa. But are there really different races? Take a gander at Acts 17.26 where it is written that God, from one man, made every nation of men. It's clear then that the Bible teaches that there is one race, the human race. The Bible is also clear that all people on the earth are descendants of Adam and Eve who were created by God. Check Genesis 1.26-28. Easy enough. God created two people in his image, male and female, and told them to increase in number. So, Wait, wait, hold up. Just two people started the human race. Who are their kids having children with? We can observe the negative effects incest has on future generations, and we're supposed to get a few thousand generations from just one bloodline with no issues. Genetics has been studied very closely in both human and animal populations, and results show there needs to be a minimum of 50 to 160 individuals, and that's with mate selection that is very closely controlled to avoid serious issues with inbreeding, so two people just doesn't seem like enough. Adam and Eve are mom and dad of the human race. Then, their children had children, and those children had children, and so on and so forth for many generations until, according to Genesis 6-9, the world's population was reduced to eight people who were protected inside an ark during a global flood. And those eight people later walked off the ark, and according to Genesis 9:19, from them came the people who were scattered over the earth. Oh, wait a second. Yeah, give us a second, because I have some questions. Did God plan the interbreeding? It seems like there is a pattern here. We already mentioned the issues from breeding a single bloodline over multiple generations, but starting again from eight people is not going to alleviate those problems. The issue also applies with the animals on the ark, which means two of every animal on the ark just isn't ideal for repopulating the earth. Never mind, let's keep going. What do I mean scattered? Well, jump over to Genesis 11 and let's talk about an event known as the Tower of Babel. Basically, because of the sinful actions of the descendants of Noah, the Lord confused their language and scattered them from there over all the earth. That's pretty clear and concise. Okay, clear or concise aren't adjectives I'd use in this case, but maybe I'm slow on the pickup. First of all, separating people into groups and dispersing them across the world doesn't negate any of the inbreeding issues as they are all descendants of the same bloodline. Secondly, why would God scramble their languages if he's going to separate them anyway? I don't see the logic in altering a person's mind to speak a different language and then placing them in a society where everyone else now speaks that same language. It seems a pointless action and doesn't really solve any problems in regards to their sinful nature. But rather than try to rationalize the actions of God, it seems easier to point out that other than the biblical reference for this event, there is no evidence to support it or any reason to project it as an alternative to evolution and genetic drift, which is supported by fossil records and gene studies. Okay, so we've got lots of people who are descendants of the eight folks who came off the ark, and now they have been scattered all over the earth. That explains that we are still one race and that different groups of people ended up in different locations. But how do we get a bunch of different colored people if we are all one race? Well, follow along. This, of course, is a simplified explanation, but the basic principles are true. We all have a pigment in our bodies called melanin, which, depending on different variables, produces different shades of the one main skin color we all possess. Several genes control the amount of melanin produced and thus the variability in the skin shade. In fact, it's easy for one couple to produce a wide range of skin shade variability in just one generation, as we'll see in just a moment. Okay, yes, certain environmental factors can affect gene expression, but things such as diet and climate don't have a dramatic enough effect to create large variation within a single generation. Genetic variation is a result of small changes which are compounded over time. 
If we take the example of skin color, our genes which control skin pigmentation are dependent on the combination of our parents' genes, but these genes don't change if a father eats too much soy one week. It's clear that genes are the biggest factor determining skin tone. What causes the variation in skin color in large groups of people is natural selection favoring a particular trait, such as darker skin over lighter skin in climates of high temperatures and sun exposure. This is because higher levels of skin pigmentation reduce the risk of skin cancer from UV radiation. Conversely, having lighter skin in places of low sun exposure, such as certain places in Europe, allows for a greater production of vitamin D. Hence, environmental adaptations occur over many generations, as individuals with favorable genes are more likely to survive and pass their genes on to the next generation. Time for a quick genetics lesson. DNA is the molecule of heredity that is passed from parents to children. A child inherits 23 chromosomes from each parent. Each chromosome pair contains hundreds of genes which regulate the physical development of the child. However, to illustrate basic genetic principles pertaining to the topic, we'll just talk about two genes, the genes that control the production of melanin. Okay, so far so good, but we should keep in mind we're trying to determine the cause for all genetic variation among humans, not just skin tone. So, let capital A and capital B symbolize versions of the gene that code for large amounts of melanin, while little a and little b code for small amounts. Got it? Easy. Check this out. Take a look at the upper left. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B genes, and mom contributes capital A, capital B genes as well. Together they will produce a child with capital A, capital A, capital B, and capital B. This is a kid with a lot of melanin, thus he will have very dark skin. Easy to see. Here's the bigger point though. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B, and mom contributes little a and little b. Well, the child's skin will be middle brown shade, the combination of capital A, little a, and capital B, little b, which by the way represents a majority of the world's population. Not only that, but if each parent is capital A little a capital B little b the combinations that could be produced in their children could result in a very wide range of skin shades in just one generation skin color is highly variable with humans I agree I really hope you don't go somewhere unsubstantiated with this so since Adam and Eve were the first people ever it makes sense to conclude that God placed in them a combination of genes that could produce all different shades of skin we see See, if we were going to say things that make sense to conclude, it makes far more sense to conclude that the Adam and Eve story doesn't check out, as the concept of over 7 billion people coming from two people breeding, without incest ruining everything, doesn't work with our current understanding of genetics. You were trying to reconcile your beliefs with that same understanding of genetics, so you can't just pick and choose what genetics you apply to the story. Those same combinations would be present in Noah and the seven other people who boarded the ark. And because God dispersed people at the Tower of Babel... You present the Tower of Babel as if it is just an accepted fact. Again, you would really need to prove this happened if you were going to base your argument for race around it. He dispersed the population, thereby isolating gene pools in the different people groups. Over time, different cultures formed in different locations with certain features like skin shade becoming predominant. Okay, so we know genetic drift can cause changes in genotype between geographically isolated populations. We can observe this process fairly easily in nature. As previously stated, the current scientifically accepted model of human evolution involves humans originating out of Africa and migrating to other parts of the globe, where geographical isolation and genetic drift would result in variations between populations. The issue with the biblical account that you presented is an enormous lack of evidence to support it. I don't see any reason to assert that a supernatural being literally scattered humanity and scrambled their language. If humans all disperse from the same location, where they live together, supposedly as one culture, why do we not have historical accounts of this event, and why did people separated from the same culture then go on to develop very different cultures with vastly different spiritual beliefs? We have fossil records, mitochondrial DNA, and gene analysis, which provide plenty of evidence to show the migration patterns of humans and other animals over the past 50,000 years. In order to accept the biblical account of Noah and the Tower of Babel, we would have to disregard all of this evidence with no measurable evidence to suggest anything different. And here we are today. And since we all go back to Noah and his family, it makes sense that we are all different shades of brown. One race, multiple people groups, just like the Bible teaches. Simplified for sure, but enough said. A point we should highlight is skin color is not truly indicative of race. It is clearly just used as an example to explain transfer of genes through descent in this scenario. However, different genetic traits are not passed on quite in the same way or develop in the same time frame. For example, the epicampal fold is a genetic trait present in North Asian populations and developed over 10,000 years in response to constant environmental pressures. Adam and Eve would not have the ability to just produce children with this fold, as it isn't a simple genetic trait like skin color, and the biblical timescale does not allow sufficient time for it to develop after the Tower of Babel event. 
That being said, we can agree on a couple of things. Yes, science also supports the idea that we are all descendants of one race, and genetic drift and natural selection can account for the variations we see in populations today. So far, all evidence supports humans evolving in Africa and then going on to colonise the rest of the world, with minor differences in human genetics being easily accounted for with genetic drift and long periods of time. So until you can present some evidence which suggests differently, there is no reason to take the Bible on its word. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, subscribe for new videos every week. If you have a video you would like us to break down, leave us a link in the comments or send us a tweet. Hit the like button and share this video around to help us raise the bar of public discourse.